1914, World War I, Northwestern Europe. Two armies stagnated across a line of defensive trenches more than 500 miles long. Out of this massive deadlock, a revolutionary new weapon emerged, one that would change warfare forever. There in the trenches, with both sides trading fire and gaining little advantage, the need was obvious. The question is, what kind of machine will enable you to break that trench stalemate? The first solution came from Winston Churchill, Britain's first Lord of the Admiralty and a lover of new technology. Churchill had been captivated by armored cars, which combined mobility and protection. Fast motor cars, and it was getting loads of publicity, all things Churchill lived for. So he backed the production of bigger and better armored cars. The vehicles were successful against German cavalry in the early months of the war when the fighting was mobile. But they struggled in the mud and craters of the Western Front. Something with more traction was needed. Trench stalemate brings about one of those light bulb moments in history. The light bulb? A piece of American farm equipment that used tracks instead of wheels. What worked on the farm could work on the front. So Britain applied the concept to the world's first tank, Little Willie. The earliest prototype was a primitive metal box riding on imported American tracks. The British hoped the tracks would keep Little Willie from getting bogged down in the mud. But early tests were disappointing. Little Willie's nose stuck out in front, so if it fell into a trench, it couldn't climb out. The tank went back to the drawing board. And so, Big Willie was created with a revolutionary new design. Its tracks went beyond the front of the body and were high enough to grip and climb over most obstacles it encountered. The secret of this design is the way the tracks wrap all the way around the body of the tank. The reason for this is that the tanks are expected to cross wide trenches, nine feet wide in some places, and rough ground. Big Willie proved it was up to the task. Its crushing power was clear, and it was quickly sent to the front. The British thought they had an answer to the German trenches. In September 1916, Britain's revolutionary war machine was unleashed on an unsuspecting enemy. You've got to imagine a type of machine that nobody had ever seen before. I don't just mean the Germans, I mean most of the British soldiers on the Somme had never seen anything like this. And they start moving in the pre-dawn mist when you can hardly see your hand in front of your face. It appears to slither along the ground. It's quite bizarre the way it moves. So far as the Germans were concerned, they called these machines the devil, and the cry soon went up along the trenches, the devil is coming. Nothing you shoot at them will stop them, and in your mind, it's you they're coming for. But once the Germans got over their initial shock, they realized Big Willie's bark was worse than its bite. The men inside the tank were vulnerable to counterattack. Well, I'm in, and there's nowhere to put my hands because I'm between the transmission and the engine, and all that's hot, and I'm already feeling claustrophobic. This is the engine, a mass of red-hot moving parts. You can imagine the heat that that generates, and every crew member is only two or three feet away from it. The only way to communicate was with one of these. Of course, the crew can't really see what is going on, and they can't really derive the comfort from looking at each other because all they see is an outline in the dark. Their face is covered by one of these chain mail masks, which is some protection against the metal splinters that flake off the side of the tank as soon as it's struck by explosive. 
the most difficult thing you have to worry about is plunging artillery fire, because artillery fire can kill a World War I tank. It's only moving three miles an hour. It's a big target. It was only when they started to open up derelict tanks and discovered only the feet and legs of burnt crew members remaining because the upper part of the torso had completely been incinerated by the furnace did it dawn on these people that they were part of a, a, a new type of warfare that nobody had ever experienced before. These slow-moving monsters were futuristic in design and shocking to see, but they were not the answer to the Allies' prayers. On the Somme, many got stuck in shell craters or were destroyed by artillery. Only a third even made it to the German lines. Big Willie was designed for one specific goal, to break through German trenches and lead the Allied soldiers forward. But in the end, its novel design was unable to stand up to the rigors of war. It was too slow had mechanical problems and was not used as effectively as it could have been. But the tank would eventually come into its own. 20 years later, in World War II, it would establish itself as a critical weapon of war. 1940, Northwestern Europe. Hitler's panzer tank division sliced through Belgium and France. Overpowering Allied defenses, they reached the English Channel in 10 days. Despite the failures of Big Willie, Germany had recognized the tank's potential and built up an impressive tank army. Ironically, one of their sources of inspiration was a British officer. Major J.F.C. Fuller the British Army is visionary when it comes to the use of the tank. After World War I, Fuller had rejected the original concept of tanks leading infantry into battle. He foresaw tank units that could be used in numbers and at high speed. Fuller's vision was radical, and the enemy was paying attention. Fuller, ironically, can't sell the idea in Britain. He can't sell the idea in America. But the Germans are reading him. One German in particular, General Heinz Guderian, the father of German tank warfare. Guderian turned Fuller's ideas into reality. High-speed armored divisions able to win battles on their own. The Panzers were unleashed on Belgium and France with great success. The early models emphasized speed over armor and firepower. They were supported by aircraft and by infantry carriers and artillery that were also on tracks. Importantly, the vehicles could also receive and send messages. There's one thing that you might not think about, but it's absolutely essential. It's the ability of one tank to communicate with another, so it's the radio. In 1940, most Allied tanks had receivers that could only handle incoming signals. But Guderian's tanks were equipped with two-way radios, so commanders could coordinate their forces during battle. Throughout 1940, the German panzer units had great success outmaneuvering and outfighting heavier Allied armor. But then, on the Eastern Front in June 1941, the tables began to turn. The Soviets rolled out a new tank that put the panzer to shame. The Soviet tank had its origins in the 1920s, on the other side of the world. One of its primary design elements came from American inventor J. Walter Christie. Christie was a one-time race driver with a passion for speed. 
He created a futuristic tank that could pierce enemy lines, soar over trenches, and cruise on tracks at over 42 miles per hour. The secret was in Christie's suspension, which was far less rigid than previous designs. They were made to crawl, his to fly. Christie invented a truly innovative system. The secret of it, ever so simple, large diameter wheels like these, and each wheel on a separate swinging arm pressing against a big spring. The swing arms were shock absorbers, allowing the track to move up and down on rough terrain. Christie offered his tank to the Americans, but they had a different philosophy on tanks and rejected it. So the Mercurial Christie sought out other buyers and sold his suspension to the Russians. They used it to create the legendary T-34. This was the tank that would take on the German Panzers in 1941. A young Leningrad engineer, Mikhail Kushkin, was put in charge of the T-34 project in the Ukraine. Kushkin's inspired idea, which exemplified a more general Russian military philosophy, was to design a tank that was basic but reliable, a workhorse on the battlefield. To prove its dependability, he drove two prototypes more than 400 miles to Moscow for his Red Army superiors to inspect. The T-34 won their approval, but Kushkin's design made no concessions to crew comfort, and his vehicles proved hardier than he. Koshkin drove this tank throughout the winter. The conditions were so bad and the distance so great that he developed pneumonia and subsequently died. But his death did little to slow the T-34 down. It quickly went into full production, and on the Eastern Front, its pace and firepower overwhelmed the German panzers. The T-34s also had another critical design feature that gave them an advantage. For the first time, it incorporated sloping armor so that incoming fire can ricochet off the armor. Sloped armor was a groundbreaking concept. The shells ricochet instead of piercing because the effective thickness of the armor gets greater as its slope increases. Earlier tanks were designed like boxes on tracks making enemy shells more likely to penetrate. But sloped armor gives the tank superior defense. It's a simple but effective concept. When an incoming shell meets a perpendicular armor surface, it goes straight through and probably kills the crew. If the armor plate is angled at 30 degrees, the shell might bury itself in the armor, but it doesn't go through. But if a shell strikes armor plate angled at 60 degrees, it bounces off, leaving the tank and crew unharmed. The T-34 is probably the finest example of the use of sloped armor. Here at the front, this very sharp nose. And they achieve this because everything that makes the tank go, and that's the engine, the gearbox, the steering mechanism, it's all at the back. The Germans countered the T-34 with the Tiger a heavy tank with a long, highly accurate gun. The Tiger had a bloody impact on the battlefield. British tank officer Peter Gudgeon witnessed its power firsthand. This is the actual Tiger that almost killed him in the Battle for Tunis in 1943. He and his men engaged a group of German tanks dug in at the top of a hill. First we knew about it was when the leading tank on my right blew up in a massive explosion. The commander and his wireless operator were blown out of the top of the turret. The tank was ablaze, an inferno. The next thing I felt was a shot passing right down my tank, just missing my right leg. I felt the draft of it on my right leg. And uh, it crashed through into the engine and set us on fire. Gudgeon expected more shots, but he and his men got lucky. A shot from another British tank struck the Tiger in the turret. 
disabling it. The German crew bailed out and fled. If it anywhere else than where it did, probably wouldn't have made any difference. One amazingly lucky hit. It wasn't long before the sophisticated firepower of the Tiger came up against the powerful T-34. They met in one of the biggest tank battles of all time. The outcome was a referendum on military capacity and on technological philosophy. 1943, Kursk, Western Russia. Nearby, in the village of Prokhorovka, one of history's most ferocious tank confrontations began. 450 German and 800 Russian tanks amassed near the top of a hill. You are face to face in this incredible encounter. It's, it's almost like hand-to-hand -hand combat with tanks. Ahead would have been hundreds of German tanks. And every single crewman must have felt they were lining up on him personally. You don't have time to think. You fire, you shoot, you ram. The feeling of vulnerability is completely accentuated by this lack of vision. All I can see is the next slope ahead and very little else. They must have felt dreadfully vulnerable. The losses are phenomenal. You have to imagine men bailing out of tanks that are on fire, and when you bail out, you're gonna get shot. The casualties on both sides were terrible. It's a holocaust on the tank battlefield because the next day, there are these hundreds of burning hulks. Though the numbers are disputed, it's estimated that close to 500 tanks were destroyed that day. And that was just one engagement in the larger battle for Kursk, which ultimately involved more than 6,000 tanks. After seven weeks of fierce fighting, the Soviets were finally able to stop the German offensive. The Soviets suffered far greater personnel and equipment losses than the Germans. But in the long run, they were better able to absorb them, in part because of their low-tech approach to tank engineering. But if there's one thing that characterizes all these Russian tanks, it's the crude finish. And it's very noticeable here on the T-34's turret. You can see cast markings, weld markings. Now, if you compare the rough finish of this tank with the German Panther over there, the contrast is fantastic. It's as if those tanks were finished off in the Mercedes-Benz body shop. It's a beautifully made machine. Though lighter and cheaper than the Tiger, the Panther was a typical example of complex German engineering. But such precision came at the expense of manufacturing capacity. Fewer than 1,400 Tigers and only 6,000 Panthers were ever finished. The Russians, on the other hand, could crank out T-34s. Mikhail Kushkin's simple, reliable design allowed them to mass produce more than 57,000 and overcome the Germans with sheer force of numbers. As the war progressed and Germany was forced from offense to defense, the army reassessed its need for fast tanks to conquer enemy territory. Now trying to defend the fatherland, they sacrificed speed for better protection. The result was the Tiger II, or King Tiger. With double the frontal armor of its predecessor, this was the heaviest tank used in World War II. It didn't prevent the German defeat, but it was another example of the mission-specific trade-offs between speed, armor, and firepower. With the changing requirements, shifting fronts, and huge armies, World War II drove rapid advances in tank design and it saw commanders developing new tactics to take advantage of these powerful, mobile weapons. Guns got bigger, armor got thicker, and killing capacity grew. 
By the close of the war, J. Walter Christie's vision of an armored racing vehicle had evolved into an all-round fighting machine that commanded the battlefield. 